Good morning, church. How's everyone doing today? Come on, you glad to be worshiping God? Come on, we serve a God that's not dead. He's alive right now. Let's give him God some praise. Let's give him all he deserves. Come on, church, all of you guys online, all of our locations. Let's just, let's just give God some praise. Come on, he came to meet with us today. He actually was waiting for you when you woke up this morning. That's the kind of God he is. I'm so glad to be with you guys this morning. I can't wait to share the word with you. Before I do, in case some of you are wondering, uh, we are going to start our series we call At the Movies, but in case you haven't noticed, it's not At the Movies this weekend. And so you may be asking yourself why, or perhaps you were invited by someone and they say, hey, come to church, you know, we do this thing called At the Movies. You're like, At the Movies, huh? what's that, what's y'all talking about? We had popcorn and sodas and movies and Jesus. Come on, somebody. But we're not doing that to movies. In case you guys don't know, there was a storm around here like 10 days ago. And uh, we have decided to continue to serve our communities. In fact, some of our campuses were, were damaged and water damage and roof damage. And so we've been working on getting those up to speed. We have people from around the country staying in some of our locations as we're doing uh, help to serve our communities. We have some of our locations or warehouses as we're receiving supplies and send them out to where people need it. And I just thought, why don't we just keep serving our community rather than, yeah, rather than jumping into this series at the movie. So you need to know we're going to start the series on October 23rd. Everybody say October 23rd. So that's two weeks from today we're going to start our series. We are still going to do it. We're going to do a three-week series. It's going to be the last two weeks in October. We're going to finish the first weekend in November. So in, invite people, and we're going to have our popcorn and sodas, and it's going to be fun, and we're going to have a good time. But uh, I just felt it'd be better for us to continue serving our community right now. So how many of y'all think that's a good idea? All right. So uh, rather than kicking off at the movies today, I just have been spending some time, you know, asking the Lord, it is my job as your shepherd is to know the state of the flock, as the scripture says. And God, what do your people need to hear today? What's, what's on their hearts or what's on your heart actually for them? And uh, I really just through praying, God just put something in my heart. Now, I don't oftentimes stand up here in this mode, but I want to help you understand the position from which I want to speak today. I really feel I have a prophetic word for us as a church today. And for those of you that are not sure what that is, it is biblical. It's Ephesians uh, 4, verse 11 and 12. It talks about how there are gifts for the church. And one of those is the office of a prophet or the gift of prophetic word in the church. And that's what I want to share today. I feel like God has put something on my heart. A prophetic word can be one of a couple of things. One is it can share with you what's to come that you don't know yet. Uh, the other one is to help you understand what is and make sense of it. And that's the direction I want to come today. And I want to speak about something that as I prayed about today, that this word just kept coming in my heart. And as I began to open the scripture and study it, God put a passage on my heart. I want to share with you today. And here's what I'd like for you to do. Take out whatever it is that you take notes with, your smart device, or you probably received a, a, a card in some, you have a pen there uh, at the back of your seat. And I want you to write this word down. Here's the, here's the word that God just kept putting in my heart today, and I want to bring sense to it and speak to it from, uh, hopefully, I believe, right from the heart of God today. Write the word down, rubble, rubble. Now, I think it's a very important topic today, and we're dealing with a lot of rubble. I want to speak to this topic today in many different ways. I want to come at it from different directions. And I was reminded of my own life in times where there was a, a lot of rubble in our lives. I remember in high school, uh, living in Louisiana, we had a leak in our roof, and we couldn't afford to repair the roof, so Dad sent me into the attic to find out where the leak was so that I could put a bucket in the attic to catch the leaking water. And there were some places where the water was leaking and, you know, getting through the shingles and, and leaking onto the rafters inside the attic. And the water would run to a place where I couldn't fit a bucket. So I was given like a knife and a machete. And I literally would put the knife and the machete inside the rafters. So as the water would run down the rafters, it would hit the knife and it could come to the end of the knife. And then I could put a bucket there to catch the water. 
I mean, uh, that's Cajun ingenuity right there. So, <laughs> so when there was a storm, the Louisiana weather, uh, the weather in Louisiana is very similar to this weather. There's a lot of showers, especially in the summer. And so when it would storm, I'd have to go in the attic and check the bucket to see how full it was and carry it down and dump it and then put it back in place. And this happened for quite some time. I don't remember how long. Uh, but then finally, dad said, boys, it's just my brother and I. I got a great plan for us this summer. We're going to redo the roof. <laughs> it is hot in Louisiana. You think it's hot here? That's like hell hot, you know. It's hot. There's no breeze. It's stifling. And we're going to spend our summer redoing the roof, getting rid of the old shingles. And so it was wonderful. We got up there with flathead shovels. We didn't have tools. We didn't know. And, and so we just started getting rid of the shingles, knocking the shingles off the roof and sliding down and piling up in huge piles of rubble all over the yard. So then once we finished putting shingles on the roof, well, what's funny, by the way, in this moment, we were praying, God, we need shingles to fix the roof. I kid you not. God, we need shingles. Please give us shingles. My mother got shingles. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And I learned a valuable lesson that when you ask God for things, you need to be specific. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> God, don't give my mama shingles. Put shingles on the roof. Yeah. <laughs> so as we're replacing the shingles and throwing the old ones onto the ground, and when we finally finished, Dad was like, Randy, you see all those shingles that rubble in the yard? I need you to pick that up. So then I had to get wheelbarrows and pick up the shingles and put them in the wheelbarrow and roll it to the driveway where there was a truck where I could load it on a truck so we could take it to the dump and we could put it in the landfill. It's the greatest summer of my life. I mean, I just still am twitching, you know, thinking about it. I'm reminded of that story because of all of the work because the rubble was so great. And I think that there are some of you here today that are dealing with rubble. I mean, it could very well, very well literally be because of the storm and the rubble that's in your life. And let me just say, by the way, those of you who have been impacted or know some people and those that are struggling with the difficulties from the Ian, which is, is, you know, a lot of the communities around us, Wachula and, and Arcadia and really further south. Uh, I am so proud of you as your pastor because we are a church that we don't run from problems. We run to them because we are called to be a church that brings hope to people when they need it. I, I don't think it's God's style church to be a bless me club. Oh, everybody gather around. Oh, we missed the hurricane. Oh, praise God. Let's just worship and like, oh, isn't this great? No, we run to the problems. We solve the problems. We serve people. And the stats of what you guys have done, let me just be uh, remindful of all the things that have happened. You saw this in the video a moment ago, but we served 28,600 hot meals in the last 10 days because of your work. 1,792 volunteers have showed up to go be the hands and the feet and the love of Jesus to people that are hurting, right? Right? We've had six semi-trucks of supplies show up, and we've distributed 108 pallets of supplies, and we have done 289 different projects all over six counties serving those who are hurting because of the rubble of this storm. Can we just praise God one more time for what he's doing through us, church? And we're not doing this to build Bayside, we're going over there, finding churches in those communities and serving those churches to help them make an impact in their communities. And I love that about you. I mean, you get it. And I'm so proud to be your pastor. I mean, you just, you make me proud. So thank you so much. You, you give as well. And those resources we use to buy all these supplies and send them out. And on behalf of the thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people that we've served and we've helped, I want to say thank you by way of showing you what this little girl in Arcadia sent to us. Thank you, Bayside, it says, and that's Dalphia. That's her name right there. So can we give God some praise one more time for all that we've done? 
Yeah. So for some of you, maybe you're literally dealing with some rubble, or for some of you, I want to talk to you about some spiritual, relational, financial rubble that is in your life. And maybe you're kind of like my family was in high school, and you're just trying to do some patchwork, try to catch the leaks that are happening in your life. You're not really ready yet, or you haven't been ready up to this point to really deal with it. Maybe for some of you, 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 you've tried to do it on your own and you don't have the tools and the equipment and you kind of feel like you're in over your head. For some of you guys, spiritually speaking, you're, the rubble may be so widespread in your life that you're kind of just overcome and you don't know what to do. And like countless stories, people have been standing there looking at the mess of their lives because of this hurricane. And all of a sudden we show up in blue shirts and it's giving them hope. I'm here to tell you today, no matter where you are in the rubble of your life, God's ready to show up and help you and in Jesus' name. Can we give him some praise for that? Come on, church. That's what God wants to speak to today. Maybe you find yourself just like the Israelites in the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah. The scripture says in Nehemiah 4.10, Judah, they said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. Maybe that would speak to you right now. If we were to really look at the rubble in your life, the problems in your life, maybe the burden is too heavy and you just feel like you're, you're just ready to give up. Your strength is failing. There's just so much rubble. rubble. We're never going to be able to rebuild. Would you please open your hearts for a moment? Would you close your eyes? And can we just give God some space here to invade our lives? God, you know what your people need to hear. I feel like I've heard from you and I pray that Somehow you would keep me out of the way, but your people might hear from you today. Devil, I know you would love to steal the word of God today. You would like to disrupt it in some way, but you can't have it. Not today, not on this watch. This word is going to go out and produce a harvest in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Now, this scripture I just read is from the book of Nehemiah. In fact, it's the last historical book for the Old Testament. There's another book called Esther that comes after it in the canon of scriptures. But historically, from a timeline, this is the last historical book written in the Old Testament. It's about a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah was living in Persia. He was actually the cupbearer for the king of Persia. And this happened in about five century before Christ. And uh, see, the Persians kind of ruled the world at this time. And Nehemiah was serving as the cupbearer. So basically, he got paid to eat food and drink wine. How many of y'all know that's a pretty good job description right there, right? Would you wait? How many of y'all wish they had jobs like that now? I get to eat, drink wine, I get paid for that? No, oh, all right. Some of you, that might be your problem. Anyway, <laughs> ah, that's funny. I don't care who you are. Okay. That was his job, right? Now, Nehemiah found out that the Babylonians had actually destroyed the city of Jerusalem, the temple, the walls, destroyed it all. And then Nehemiah hears about this. And that's where we are in this story. And Nehemiah goes to the king of Persia and he risks his own life. And he really says, hey, here's what's going on with my people. Will you grant me success and help to go? And so the king of Persia sends Nehemiah to go and rebuild the wall, clean up all the rubble and rebuild the wall. So there are some lessons that we're going to learn today from Nehemiah when it comes to cleaning up rubble and rebuilding our lives. And I want you to write this first word down. Here's the first principle we can learn, and that is ownership. You need to take responsibility for the rubble in your life. And that's what Nehemiah did. Back in Nehemiah chapter 1, it says, when Nehemiah heard this, when he heard about the rubble and the problems in Jerusalem... He sat down and he, and he wept, church. In this word wept, he didn't just cry. It's like a mourning if you study in the Hebrew. I mean, he, like from his core, from his bowels, he was just mourning so loud that it was uncontrollable. I, I don't know where you are. Maybe when you've ever like noticed how bad a situation was in your life and you've kind of lost all hope. You, you remember in moments like that in your life and it was like a punch in the gut and you just couldn't handle it anymore? That's where he is. Maybe you're like that today. That's where Nehemiah was. And so he mourned and he fasted and he prayed to God of heaven. And then he said, oh Lord, 
God of heaven, the great and awesome God, you keep your covenant of unfailing love with those that you love and or those that love you and who obey your commands. He says, listen to my prayer, God, and look down and see I'm praying right now day and night. I confess that we've sinned. Yes, even my own family and I, we have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying your commands and your decrees and your regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. But, but please, Lord, remember also what you told your servant Moses, that if you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, the Lord says, I'm going to bring you back to this place, the place that I've chosen for you so that I can be honored. There's a couple of words in here that I think are very important. The first one is God says, even if you're exiled to the furthest places of the earth, I don't know if you feel like you have been lost, you have been abandoned, you have been running away from God, or you find yourself in a place where you feel so far away from God. But let me tell you something, God's arm can reach to the furthest ends of the earth, church. In fact, he created the heavens and the earth. So you're not at a place where he can't be. He created the place where you are right now. God's arm can reach you. And so you need to know that. He's a, he's a big God. Come on, everybody say, he's a big God. And I like that because this is a promise from God's word. The Bible is loaded with 7,000 promises, which is why you need to be in the word all the time anyway. Look, the word of God is not, should not just be something that you hear somebody speak about when you come to church on Sunday. But God's word can speak to you all the time. There's 7,000 promises for God's word. And here's how it happens to me. I'm reading sometimes and I got issues in my life too. I know you think I'm a professional Christian, but we, we pastors, we have problems too. Like we're paid, but we're, we're paid to be good, but we're not always good. We got issues in our life and you're good. You're good too. You just are good for nothing. No. <laughs> yeah, you get it. You, get, you just don't get paid. But whatever. And I find myself oftentimes <laughs> reading God's word and I'll notice a promise and it's exactly what I need at the time. But I have to take ownership and get into God's word. I have to take ownership and say, God, what do you have for me? But he says there that this is a promise that God will bring you back. But for every promise in the word of God, there's what I like to call a premise. There's our responsibility. And so that means you and I have to take some responsibility for the rubble that's in our lives. Oh, that's a bad, that's a bad thought in America these days. Because nobody wants to take responsibility for their problems. We have therapists who are loaded with people to talk to so they can talk about blaming other people for their problems. And there's nothing wrong with getting help, and I think you should. But here's what I think you need to know is at some point in time, you're going to have to quit blaming other people, and you're going to have to say, okay, what's my responsibility for the rubble in my life? Oh, let me tell you something. Let me just tell you something. If you blame other people for the rubble in your life, you will feel better about your circumstances, but they will not change. You need to hear what I'm telling you, church. It'll take the responsibility and put it on someone else, and you'll feel better about yourself. Like, oh, but guess what? Your circumstances will still be there. But if you take ownership, and as this scripture says, Nehemiah confessed he repented, he returned to the Lord, and then God can bring you back and place you where he designed you to be anyway. But only God can do that if you take responsibility and say, okay, God, I choose to take responsibility. It doesn't mean that other people didn't do things wrong. I'm not saying that's true, but you're the only one that can take responsibility for yourself. I don't know if you've noticed, but you can't change other people. How many of you tried really hard? How I many of you sitting next to someone, you like, if they just listen to me, it'd be a lot easier, right? Don't even raise your hand. You're going to get lit up right now. You, oh, no, we're going to have to have a healing service. You can break a rib. <laughs> but you can't change other people. But you know who you can change? Hey, come on, everybody say me. me. You want to move from a place of where you are in your rubble 
and you want to overcome that, it's real simple. The scripture says righteousness exalts people, a nation, but sin condemns. You and I need to get to the place where we say, all right, God, I take responsibility for the rubble that's in my life. I'm going to own it. I'm going to repent. I'm not going to blame other people. I'm going to say, God, I'll take ownership of the problems in my life. I'm going to look in the mirror, look at myself first, and not worry about other people because I can't change them anyway. Righteousness exalts a nation. You know how you can have God lift you up over your problems? I can tell you, you got to hit your knees. How kind of righteousness exalts a nation? I'll show you what kind of righteousness. This kind of righteousness right here. Like, God, I messed up. My life is beyond me. I surrender myself to you. And God, you're the only one that can get me out of this. So God, do whatever you need to do and get my life back on track. Get me on my feet again. In Jesus' name, you, Lord, are responsible for that. Come on, church, you got to take ownership in Jesus' name. And I think it's time for us as Christians to quit blaming other people anyway. In fact, if this nation is ever going to be exalted, it's going to happen because we choose to humble ourselves like 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Oh, we love this verse. If my people who will call by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Come on, that's a great verse for America in Jesus' name. Can we praise God for that? But it doesn't say if other people will humble themselves. If my people will humble themselves. Let me just tell you something. Righteousness will exalt this nation because we choose to do the righteous thing. You know, church, I believe with all my heart, it's time for us as Christians to know what the Word of God says and vote according to the Word of God. And so you need to be informed. Don't vote because of, well, you know, I don't really care what party somebody's at. All I care about is the word of God to be the foundation that these people make decisions on. And that's the people that I'm going to put in office and I'm going to vote for. And I'm going to humble myself and say, I take responsibility. Your vote counts. We got another one coming up in a month. And it's time for Christians to rise up by humbling themselves and saying, God, let righteousness exalt this nation, starting with me on my knees right here. Come on, church. That's how we make our lives. That's how we make this nation great. And so quit complaining and quit ranting on social media and just humble yourself and do your part in Jesus' name. Okay. All right. Y'all ready? Take ownership. Everybody say, that's me. And anytime you decide to clean up the problems and the rubble in your life, you can darn well expect opposition. Nehemiah faced some opposition. He got over there, started rebuilding the wall, and what happened? He says, so we rebuilt the wall till it reached half of its height, and the people worked with all their, everybody say it, heart. Come on, everybody say that word, heart. But when Sanballat and Tobiah the Arabs and the Ammonites and the people of the Ash of Ashdod, the Ashdonites, when they heard that the repairs of the walls, that they were going ahead and the gaps were actually being closed, they got angry. And they plotted together that they might come and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against us. But we prayed to God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. I, I love this because these people had it in their heart. You know how the devil wants to keep you from cleaning up the problems in your life? He wants to discourage your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart. That's your passion, your desires, the seed of appetite in your life. You have to guard it with everything. So the devil will bring opposition in your life. So you'll give up and say, oh, well, it's just too much. And you lose it in here. You don't lose the battle out there. You lose it in your heart. And we got to decide, no, I'm going to keep my heart strong in Jesus' name. You know how you keep your heart strong? You got to get in the Word. You got to be in church. You got to be around right people. I'll get the rest of this later. But I'm just going to tell you, that's how you keep your heart strong. I'll never forget or never forget. This happened a couple of days ago. I woke up early and starting my day and my daughter Emily was up and she was in the kitchen getting ready to go off and do her food truck. And we're sitting there and I'm making my drink, getting my morning ready to get started. And I just spilled my drink all over the kitchen. 
How many of you hate when that happens first thing in the morning? Like, it's going to be one of those kind of days, right? I mean, like, I can see it right now. And I went, no, it is not going to be one of those kind of days. Devil, shut up. I'm going to have a good day. I went and got a towel, cleaned it all up with a smile, and made another drink. And you know what? Nothing else bad happened the rest of the day. I had to choose in that moment, devil, you're not getting my heart. I'm going to live with a good attitude, and I'm going to trust God for big things in my life. You can start early. You can get me in the middle of the day. You can get me late. You can wake me up in the middle of the night. You ain't getting my heart in Jesus' name. You're not going to discourage me. I'm telling you, if you're going to clean the rubble in your life, Bayside, you got to get your heart right. Be ready for opposition. But you know how the devil does it? People. How I many, you know, people just so, uh. People is like, uh. Well, I mean, that's what, that's what the, the, the Israelites, they faced. Some guys that he called even people out. He like on social media ranting. You know, that old sand ballot and Tobiah, those people, they crazy. And then he just starts naming a bunch of different people, like the, the Ammonites and the Astodites and the Parasites and the, and, the, and the Termites and all those people just causing trouble. He just naming all kinds of people. He was mad. But the devil uses people. And you got to get to the place where you go, I'm not listening to all that negativity. I'm not going to let people bring me down. We get a shirt, hashtag, not today, devil. Ain't happening today. Stop it in Jesus' name. Listen, I, I, I like what he did because not only did Nehemiah have to deal with opposition, and look what he says in Nehemiah 6, chapter 3, when these people were still bothering him, they wouldn't give up. He said, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. I'm going to tell you right now, the great work that God wants to do in your life, you just keep building and you look at all those negative people and go, I ain't coming down from this. You, I ain't coming down to where you are. I'm staying up here on higher ground and I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I love my new AirPods I got. They got that noise cancellation mode. Somebody can, uh, 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 sorry, I can't hear you. I got my noise cancellation on. <laughs> That's what you need to do to the devil. I can't hear you today. I got my noise cancellation mode on, and you just keep going, but I ain't listening. I'm following what God has for me, and you can do all you want. I'm doing something great, and I can't come down. In fact, that's the verse my pastor gave me 20 years ago when I was coming to start this church. He said, Randy, you get over there, and you build a great work, and you don't come down. You know why that's so important? Because if you came down from the work that God has you to do, every time somebody said something about you on Facebook, or anytime somebody at work said something about you wasn't true, you'd spend your whole life refuting what those people said, and you'd never do anything great for God. Just don't even listen to it. Everybody say, shut up, devil. <laughs> you can't say shut up unless it's to him. That's like an S word in our house growing up. You can't tell people, shut up. Shh, don't do that. Y'all tell the devil, not today, in Jesus' name. You need to take ownership. You're going to face opposition you're going to like this point. Write this down. Order. I mean, I'm, let me say, you, you're not going to like it, but you're going to love it. You're going to dislike what I'm going to tell you, but you're going to really need to hear it. And that is we need to order our lives around God and his word. That's what Nehemiah said. He said after he looked things over, he stood up and he said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives and your homes. Those who carried materials, they did their work with one hand and they had a weapon in the other. And each of the builders, they wore the sword at their side even while they worked. We need to order our lives, church, around God. And let me just tell you something right now because he says it. Remember how great and awesome God is. And we look at our problems now and we're so focused on the rubble in our lives, we forget the great things that God has already done. How many times have you been in places before in your life and you thought, I am never going to overcome this? Yet yeah, here you are today. Why? Because God is great and God is awesome. And if he was great and awesome in the past, He'll be great and awesome now. The problem is we go, God, 
why are these things happening to me now? Well, God's great and awesome even when bad things happen. It just means when you're in the middle of terrible things that he's there with you. He will never leave you or forsake you, and you need to remember that. How do you remember that? They had to carry the sword with them all the time, which is the Word of God. I'm telling you, church, the Word of God, being a Christian isn't some label. Being a Christian means your life is founded and built upon the rock of Jesus Christ and his word, and I don't moisten my finger, and I don't stick it up in the wind, and go, what does culture say, and what's convenient for me today, but no, I'm building my life on God's word, and I'm not about to let anything take priority. My order is Jesus Christ, and his word, and his church, first and foremost, and that's how I clean up the rubble in my life. Come on, church, I'm telling you, this is what you need to hear. You don't, maybe you don't want to hear it. I, I think the problem is, we have our lives ordered improperly. Is whether I feel like going to church today. I don't know. The weather's kind of good. Maybe we should go on the boat today. I don't know. We had the storm and we couldn't go out. And so and it's kind of calm today. It's going to be great. Let's go on the boat today. We'll watch online. You don't even watch online. Oh, we'll catch it later. You don't catch it later. You just completely miss it and you put the boat first. Oh, my kids got a game this weekend and it's a big tournament and we got to go and we'll just watch church later. And we wonder why there's rubble in our lives because we have forsaken the Lord and the priority of Him first, but it's seek Him first first church and then he adds everything else to our lives and and you may think well you don't know my life oh I have four kids and I pastor this church too and I still I would come to church and I'd run over and watch a little bit of the game and I'd come back to church and I'd do church and I'd run back and watch the rest of the game and then I'd sit here on my phone I'd get updates about the game but you know what I didn't allow that to take priority over my life my order was the Lord first and it's not because I'm a pastor because I'm a Christ follower that's why and I'm gonna have rubble in my life it happens but when I order myself according to the word of God and I carry my sword with me all the time I don't just use it on Sundays or when I'm in trouble like just scrolling through God give me something I got a daily diet of God's word do I like it all the time no I like to sleep but it if I need help with my rubble, if my life that's in the four corners of this world that is as far away from what God wants is going to be in order, then I'm going to have to allow him to bring me back because I repent and I confess and I say, Lord, I'm taking responsibility. And your life needs to be ordered with God. We don't do these things because I'm a pastor. My life is ordered by God because I'm a Christian and I'm not a label of a Christian. My, I don't play for the name on the back of the jersey. I play for the name on the front of the jersey because it's about the capital C church. It ain't about Randy. And it just breaks my heart because people are casual in their relationship with God sometimes and the way they raise their kids. And I don't know, church or not church, God's word. And I, I don't know. And then I see people and their just lives are, I don't know what happened. There's rubble all over my life. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I love you. Let me give you a hug. But man, we, could, we can do better this time. We ain't going to do that again. And God's going to rebuild our lives because we're going to order ourselves around him and his word. In Jesus' name. Can you give him praise one more time? And the last one is others. You got to take ownership. You repent. You take ownership of the rubble in your life. Be ready for some opposition. Order your life around God's word. And you need other people. Because Nehemiah, he said, I stationed people behind the lowest points of the wall. Places that were exposed and I posted them by families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Let me just make sure you're aware of something because a lot of times we are unaware. It's because it's called deception. We don't realize that we have exposed areas in our life. And we think, no, I'm good, I got this. No, you ain't. You ain't, you ain't, you ain't that good, I'll prove it to you. How many of you sitting real close to somebody, like they all jacked up, they need some help? Come on, raise your hand right now. You just, yeah, come on, just expose them right now. Just like they need it. 
And you probably like sitting there like, why are you raising your hand? Is somebody on the other side of you? No, that was for you. That's, that's for you. But he didn't just station people in the areas that were low, that needed help. He also stationed people that knew how to work a sword that they had the word of God. And there's too many times we have people in our lives, oh yeah, that's my friend, yeah, they got me, but their life is a mess too. And they won't say, well, let me tell you what the word of God says. I had a conversation with somebody the other day and it's like, man, we're going through something in our lives and what do you think I should do? And he started telling me all the things that he was doing and a couple of other people that he talked to and I was like, hey, hey, those things are great, but let me tell you the real truth. Let's get to some spiritual things of order in your lives and putting the word of God in your hand every day and the things that you need to begin to do. And he was like, oh, thank you for telling me what I needed to hear. Like, it's okay for attaboy, but sometimes we got to go, look, you are exposed in some areas, and the devil's going to get you, and you're never going to clean up the rubble in your life unless you order yourselves and get the right people around you that will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. I knew y'all would be quiet today, but I I don't care. Let me give you a word of encouragement then. Because it says in Nehemiah that on October 2nd, the wall was finished. 52 days after we had begun. And when the enemies in the surrounding nations, when other people saw it, they were frightened and humiliated because they realized the work had been done with the help of God. I don't know what the rubble is in your life, but God will rebuild it if you allow him to work in your life, church. Today's a great day for that. In fact, would you just close your eyes? Would you bow your heads? Would you think of the rubble in your life right now? And would you just in your own heart just begin to surrender it to him? Take ownership of it right now. God, we stand before you today as the people who need your help. So right now we surrender our lives. We look at our rubble. We assess the situation and we realize that we need you. So God, with all that we have, we surrender to you. We ask for your help. We're ready for opposition. Devil, it's over today. Today's the new day. Because we begin to order our lives completely different. We surround ourselves with the right people. And the wall of our lives is being rebuilt in Jesus' name.